Hello and welcome to our first physics lab. This is going to be a lab on measurements and uncertainty. Just to sort of get our feet wet with some of the uh, instruments that we're going to be using in lab. Here in front of me I have a meter stick, a plastic ruler, some, a pair of vernier calipers, and a double pan balance, also a meter tape. Now, this lab sort of focuses on just making measurements and doing some simple calculations, also doing some graphing. And so, let's talk about those measurements. Before you come to lab, you were to have read the sections uh, linked uh, right here on this webpage to measurements and uncertainty, um, also error analysis, significant figures, and graphing with Logger Pro. So, let's take the meter stick for our first example. Now the meter stick, if you look at its smallest demarcations, the very smallest increment on the meter stick has a width of one millimeter. So these are one millimeter marks. And so when we make a measurement, let's say I'm going to try to maybe measure the um, diameter of this cup. And so let me go from 10, it looks like it has a diameter of 9.4 centimeters or 94 millimeters, just going to the least count of the instrument. Least count means the smallest demarcations. And if I just use the least count as a measure of my uncertainty, I can say that my uncertainty is plus or minus a millimeter. And so if I wanted to write that data point, it would look like this. 9.4 centimeters plus or minus 0.1 centimeters. And this would be my data point. This is how I'd write it. Here's my uncertainty, and here is the actual measurement itself. And so as you can see, the uncertainty was determined by the least count. Now sometimes I can, if I'm really precise with this, I can do some estimating. So let's talk about estimating with the meter stick. I'll make that same measurement. It still looks like 9.4 centimeters, but maybe I can estimate to in between the, the uh, smallest demarcations. Maybe to the nearest one half of a millimeter. It looked like it was close to the halfway mark between 9.4 centimeters and 9.5 centimeters. And so I'd write that like this. I would say that's equal to 9.45 centimeters plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. Now that I'm estimating, my uncertainty has got a little smaller. It's going to the nearest half of a millimeter or the nearest 0 0.05 centimeters. And so this is the same measurement, but this one is a little more precise because I'm estimating my uncertainty. And so <coughs> As you can see here, the difference in these two measurements is the number of significant figures. This has two, and this has three, which you know by reading the resource on significant figures. Another thing to note about these measurements is that the uncertainty itself is to the same precision as the measurement. This is to the tenths place, this is to the hundredths place, both the measurement and the uncertainty. So. When we're doing calculations that involve significant figures, those significant figures, if they're coming from uh, data points that you measure, that measured uncertainty is what controls how many significant figures are in your data. And then that propagates throughout your calculations. Let's take a look at a couple of more measuring devices. The double pan balance is what you'll use to measure mass and you put a mass on one side and move these sliding masses around until it balances. If the sliding masses aren't enough to balance this, then you can set an offset mass on the other side, but you'll have to add that mass in to your total sum. So moving this around, it looks like this graduated, this uh, aluminum cylinder has a mass of about 70.04 grams. The smallest mark on this is a tenth of a gram, or the nearest um, 0.1 grams. And so I would write that out then. This data point would be 
70 point four grams plus or minus zero point one grams. And so I've I've measured this weight or this mass to the nearest tenth of a gram. And again, I can go beyond that. This is three significant figures. I can estimate to the nearest halfway point and say that looks like it's actually 70.40. In other words, it's closer to 40 than it is to 45 or 35, point, point 0.45 or point 0.35 grams plus or minus 0 0.05 grams. So by estimating, I've increased my precision to the hundredths place and now I have four significant figures. Now the last uh, instrument I'll talk about is the vernier calipers. Now vernier calipers can be a pretty precise way of measuring widths. Okay. And we don't do any estimating with the vernier calipers. And then this is small, I, I don't know if you can see how it works, but I do have this large set of vernier calipers. And so let's say I'm going to measure something. Whoa. Okay, that's good enough. So as you can see here, I've opened the jaws of this to measure an item. And so this is one centimeter from zero to one to two to three centimeters. Now this mark here tells me where, how wide this is. So this is between 1.1 centimeter and 1.2 centimeters. So I get my last digit, this is 1.1 something, the way I get my last digit is I follow along the calipers and I find where one of these top lines lines up well with the bottom line. Looks like that one lines up the best. And so let's count over, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth line lines up well with the line beneath it. And so that's my last decimal of precision, 1.16 centimeters, and this is plus or minus 0 0.01 centimeter, using the huge vernier caliper. And so I'd write it like this, 1.16 centimeters plus or minus 0 0.01 centimeters. And so by that I can get uh, pretty good precision using vernier calipers. It's usually much better than just using a meter stick or a plastic ruler. Now once you've made these measurements and you know the uncertainty, you know the number of significant digits in the measurements, then you can use those in your calculations. And so in the measurements in error lab, we're going to calculate the volume and after that the density of this aluminum sample. And use your resource on significant figures to make sure you have the correct number of significant figures in your final answer. And we're going to do another calculation which is a percent difference or perhaps a percent error calculation where you'll compare this density of aluminum to the known to a given density of aluminum. And doing this, again, you'll have to watch out and make sure that you're using the correct number of significant figures and that you have the correct units, or lack thereof, in the final answer. The last activity of this lab is going to be graphing with Logger Pro. And in order to do that, you have to open up Logger Pro. It's on your computer. And when there's no uh, data acquisition device attached to it so that you can acquire data from an external apparatus. It really just works as a spreadsheet, a graphing spreadsheet. And so when you put values of X and Y in the spreadsheet, it'll show you the graphical relationship. Before you do this, be sure to read the resource on graphing with Logger Pro so that you can set your graph up according to the parameters required for having a good looking graph in your notebook and in your reports. Now, um, whenever you graph two variables against each other to determine their relationship, it's usually on an x-y coordinate plane. 
And if the points come in fairly linear, so that you can fit a regression line through them, and it looks pretty, looks like it fits the data pretty well, you would say, I think I have a linear relationship. Or maybe you get something that has, you know, a curvature to it, maybe something that looks quadratic. And so you, by doing this, by graphing variables against each other, and these variables come from data that you require in an experimental laboratory setting, you can make mathematical models of the relationship between these, these, uh, these two uh, items that you put on your axis. Now in today's lab, we're gonna do that. We're gonna look at the relationship between two variables. And these variables are the diameter of a circular object and the circumference of a circular object. Now most of you already may have a clue that there is a, a well-established relationship between diameter and circumference. But you're gonna verify that in a laboratory setting. I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but once you get these variables plotted against each other in longer pro, the, uh, you should be able to extract information from the curve fit. You'll actually you know, fit this with a curve fit. Instructions are in longer pro. And it, that curve fit gives you parameters. It'll give you the uh, x and x squared, or, or rather the, um, it'll give you the a, b, and c parameters in the quadratic. It'll also give you the slope of a, of a linear graph. These parameters are mathematically calculated for you, and so from the slope of a linear graph, or from the parameters of a quadratic, or, or an exponential, or whatever, you'll get useful physical information about the relationship between two um, sets of variables, or a set of variables. So do that with circumference and diameter with several round objects. You can build a data set of circumference and the corresponding diameter.